This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. We had assembled in a very small office that we are having in Connecticut, very few people. There were five, I think. And uh, in, in another place, what we call the Data Monitoring Committee, which is a group of experts, independent experts, they are on Pfizer, we're going to have uh, the opportunity to unblind the data and then uh, tell us if the study needs to continue or if it is successful or if it fails. And we were waiting for their call. So the call came a little bit later than what was expected, which created a lot of uh, anxiety to all of us but came around, I think, two o'clock. You're just sitting there waiting? What were you feeling? Sitting there waiting and teasing one another, huh. uh, drinking coffee, making jokes. So what? how did you feel like when you heard the results, the successful results? Free, liberated, um, happy. Uh, like if uh, a huge weight that was uh, on my shoulders was lifted. You know, we do a lot of that anyway. This is what we do in our daily work. We are putting money, we are investing in research, which is highly risky. The difference in that case was that we didn't risk at all. We put it all in. We put everything in one go so that we don't lose time. Usually we'll spend 50 millions, and then if that goes well, then we will spend another 50, and then if it goes well, then 100. Here we put all together a little bit more than $2 billion, $2.3 billion. And uh, it was a significant decision, but it was a very easy decision to make in the context of what we were living at that time. It was a pandemic. People were scared. We were scared. We didn't know how tomorrow will look like. Uh, we were living unprecedented situations, and uh, we knew that we have capabilities that may help. So there was not a second uh, question or choice. We go all in. I think about it all the time, and I know very well that if you focus too much on making money, you will never make. You should focus in what is the real value driver. And the real value driver, it is to make breakthroughs that change patients' lives. If you don't do that, you will never make money. If you do that, don't worry. Things will fall into place and also money will follow. But the mentality of the company is to be how to help the patient. And that's what the management was that the shareholders want, because that's the only way that we can create value. In this particular case, we're not thinking at all about what are we going to make when we sell it or if we not sell it, because what we were focusing 100% was how to bring a solution to the world that will help all of us change the way, the fear that was bring hope to the world. And uh, as always, when you do that, you will have good returns as well. Not at all, because the studies are highly regulated. Everybody knows what regulators, and when I say regulators, FDA, European authorities, UK authorities, Israeli authorities, Japanese authorities, Canadian authorities, want to see how the study needs to be conducted and what exactly they need to see to approve it or not. So clearly, everybody takes into consideration how much money I'm going to invest and what is the chances that I'm going to, to lose them. But what you can do is just to change the rules of the game so that you won't lose the money. There are very well-established methodologies that would say with very high precision if your medicine is effective, if your medicine is safe. And those are there for all and are playing with the same rules. I think the relations with, uh, with regulators, they have been always very transparent. And there are a lot of uh, laws that... Uh, they are forcing uh, regulators to and companies to put out there their interactions and what exactly was discussed. Now, to, to go into specific details of uh, 
of some discussions. I don't know what is the reason that FDA wants to take that time, and, but I'm sure they have very good reasons. But this is not um, a black box. We know very well what uh, is the process. Everybody knows very well what are the processes. The review process also, it is very detailed. They have scientists of very, very high caliber. Not every regulator in the world, but the Europeans, the, the Brits, the FDA clearly, they have very, very high caliber of scientists that they are going into a lot of details. And uh, also, basically everything for a study is really released by law in the specifications of the product, but it's a very detailed document yeah. that it is issued and has basically the essence of everything was discussed. I don't know uh, about uh, specific documents if take them time to, to release, but clearly this is not a black box uh, type of process. I have zero doubts that this is not affecting at all their ability to be unbiased and regulate and in order to for the the system also reinforces that by creating significant time barriers if someone moves from an industry right. to FDA he won't be able to deal with topics for a period of time and then for even an enhanced period of time with topics that are related with the company he or she may come from i think these um, regulators they are really very strict uh, rightly so if anything i feel sometimes that maybe they should uh, be a little bit more open-minded, particularly when it comes to new technologies, rather than trying to judge and implement the same framework of evaluation of new technologies to all. They are always, as regulators, in the conservative side. But uh, always, always, they are unbiased and they are trying uh, the best. And it's not only one or two people. They have processes to make sure that there are self-checks and balances within the agencies, both in CDC and in the FDA. Difficult decisions, they bring external experts that they should express. Easy decisions, they are internal experts that they are debating a lot. And if there are disagreements, they elevate them. So I think it's uh, we are lucky to have good regulators. I think I agree with what you said before. As with all governmental agencies, there is bureaucracy. And the bureaucracy needs to be addressed. And by saying bureaucracy is not relaxing the the bar, the bar needs to remain high, but uh, being uh, focusing on what matters rather than uh, on the on the detail. I think there is always uh, the the fear of corruption, particularly when you speak about public servants. But uh, clearly, the risk is very different country by country. And uh, speaking about and agencies by agencies, I think the regulatory agencies uh, have a very good track record and history of the US, of Europe, of uh, England, of uh, very, very good track record of integrity. I would say that uh, I recognize what you said about what happened in, uh, or what I'm, I'm sure that uh, what you describe in, in the country that you're coming from, it was how you experienced it. And I know that there are other countries that you need to do these things to do your job. Uh, I don't think it's the case uh, in, in this uh, country, particularly when it comes to those agencies that you mentioned. I think they have a very high track record. And also, I don't think that there are a lot of people that they are worried about it or doubt it. I'm sure, like everywhere, there will be a minority, but the vast majority of the Americans, the vast majority of the Europeans, the vast majority of the Brits, the vast majority of the Israelis, they trust what FDA or EMA or CDC or MHRA will say. Reputation is something that uh, you can lose in buckets, but you can end it back in drops. <laughs> and uh, yeah. once you lost it, uh, you are going to take a lot of effort to bring it back. And the pharmaceutical industry lost it. It's clear that the reputation of the industry in the last decade 
was on uh, the lowest that uh, we have seen ever. And uh, for there are many reasons for that, but clearly uh, there are reasons that are related also with the behavior of the industry. That needed to change, and I'm hopeful that uh, very few will disagree that the industry is a very different industry right now. That being said, I truly believe that uh, if there is one lesson that stands out from the many lessons that we learned during COVID, is the power of science in the hands of the private sector. I think it was the private sector that came with solutions with diagnostic tests when we didn't have, solutions with respirators when we didn't have, solutions with treatments, solutions with vaccines. And I think that demonstrated very clearly to the world the value of a thriving life sciences sector, private life sciences sector to society. That also affected very positively the reputation, both of the sector and of Pfizer. I'm not going to make the mistake to consider it given. I'm not make, to make the mistake that because our reputation is high, that will remain so. We need to earn it every day. Every day with everything we do, with everything we say, with the way we behave. And uh, I hope that we'll rise to this occasion and we'll do that. The extra case uh, in 2009 was related to things that happened in 2003. And the things that happened in 2003 were things that uh, basically several of our reps did off-label promotion. So they spoke about, with the physicians, about off-label use of the product, and they shouldn't. And, uh, correct. And this is something that it is allowed when physicians are speaking to physicians, but it is not allowed for the pharmaceutical companies to refer to these studies, because usually are studies that are happening off-label. And uh, apparently, several of our reps in 2003, they did it. And uh, we had to uh, to settle in 2009, and we paid a very big fine, as you said. The fine was related not to the severity of the conduct, but the size of the revenues. So this, the, the fines are, if Baxter was a small product, we would get a small fine. Baxter was a very big product, and we got a very large fine. Very bad what happened in 2003. I don't think that uh, these things happened since then. We have a stellar record from 2009 until now of uh, complying with every single regulation and rule. We have internal processes to make sure that these are not happening by individuals that may have an interest. For example, to get a promotion, they may try and do things that they are not the right things. And uh, we have, more importantly, a culture in this company that really sets aside people that they think differently. So I didn't like what happened in 2003, uh, but I believe a lot has changed in the 20 years that followed, or almost 20 years. I, I think that we try always to do the right thing. And that's, as I said, very well embedded into our culture. If you don't do the right thing, sooner or later you will pay for it, one way or another. Yeah. And right now, for us doing the right thing, it is being able to find innovations to issues that are real, diseases that they do not have good coverage, good treatments right now. We try to find treatments that significantly surpass the current standards of care. And we try not only to comply with what regulators are asking us to do, this is what you need to do to prove the safety or the efficacy, but exceed them. No matter what we do on that, I'm sure that people will find opportunity because, as you said, there are a lot of lawyers to, to sue us. But we believe in the justice system, and we believe that uh, eventually, if you are doing the right thing, you will be on the right side of the history. <music> I think people uh, could go one way or another because of multiple reasons. 
from our perspective, we I don't think we have uh, aggressive marketing. What we do, we go on TV and we are having uh, ads about our products and uh, they are highly regulated. I think it is the right of people to know, to learn that if there is a product like that. It's very clearly that we cannot say things that they are off-label, that have not been approved. We need to have, every time we go on TV, as you know, FDA is forcing us to say also the bad things that can happen for a medicine. Sometimes that takes more time than the good things. And I don't think that we are doing aggressive marketing. Now, people could be influenced uh, in, and can be biased in, in the podcasts or in the other type of media uh, activities that they have for multiple different reasons. You need to know that we are so, so careful with sponsorships. First of all, we have very few, very, very few. We have a team that for every single one, could be $2,000, they will try to see if there is a conflict of interest in the way we do it. And also, what is the reputation of the of the, the persons or the programs that we are sponsoring? So I don't think um, our friend, I think, was from Texas. Uh, yes. Yeah. I, I don't Joe Rogan, yes. <laughs> yes. I, I don't think he, he got it right that uh, we do uh, those type of things. We don't. Oh, in terms of manip- like having a, f- a negative effect on... Not uh, even having aggressive sponsorships. We have very few. Yeah, when you clip them all together. And most of the sponsorship that we have, it is more on patient-related organizations right. rather than uh, we are very careful not to sponsor other things that can be perceived, not even uh, influenced, but perceived that we may influence. So we are very, very careful on that. This is not the case with us. The vaccines take years to do that. And uh, the, the time uh, that it takes, it is basically... Uh, the vast majority, the time to conduct the final phase three study, what is the confirmatory study. And you do that because the phase three study costs a lot of money. In our case, it costs almost a billion. So you don't want to go and risk a billion in blinded data normally before you do a lot of experiments to make sure that the product that you're putting in the phase three is the right one. Uh, we didn't have that time. So we risk all the money. So we went into, we condensed all the time towards this phase three. But the phase three study had to follow all the rules that any study follows when you do this trial. Could you just briefly describe the basics of what is phase one, what is phase two, what is phase three? Let's say that there are so many phases when you try, first of all, to find what is the right vaccine. We tried from 20 different vaccines, we nailed down to four. And for those four, we selected eventually two and then eventually one. Once you have those selections, what is the dose you're going to use? And then we, we tried multiple different doses to see which one we, we think is the best. What does trying entail in those early days? You go, first of all, with uh, smaller v- doses in humans. And then after you have done a lot of experiments in animals, so that you can feel that it is safe enough to go to humans and then go with very low dose. And then you gradually increase the dose and then you monitor those humans to make sure that uh, there are not any, let's say, reactogenicity to what you are giving them. At the same time, you start to measure what is doing in terms of uh, immune responses. So you do that with multiple vaccines and you do that with multiple doses and you do that with multiple ages of people, young people, old people, and um, eventually, uh, from the 20 vaccines to multiple doses to multiple schedules? Is it after three weeks, the second dose? Or is it after four weeks or after six months? All of that will inform you that I think this is the vaccine, this is the dose, this is the scheme that I believe will give me the best results. And when you have that, then you go to do what we call the phase three. This is a very big study with thousands of people where you use the vaccine that you think is the right one, and a placebo. Mm -hmm. The placebo and the vaccine, they look identical. Nobody knows if is injected a placebo or a vaccine. The physician that makes the injection, the doctor doesn't know if he's injecting 
placebo or vaccine. He knows a, a, a barcode. Only the computer knows. In order to go into this computer, there are keys, and there are at least two people that need to put their keys so that someone can see the data. And there's those people, they have legal obligations never to do that, right? So before a certain point. So all of that is blinded. The idea is that when you go into this study, uh, you need to make sure that you are going with the right one. That's why it takes so many, so much time. But the study is the study. You need to have a significant number of people that uh, will give the two, and then you let them live their lives, and then you see how many of them will get the disease, and then you see if th there are differences in percentage of infections for the vaccinated compared to the non-vaccinated. At the same time, you are monitoring all of them to see if there are differences in the safety profile. If those that they got the placebo have the same, let's say, heart attacks with those that they didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, they got the vaccine because heart attacks will happen if you have 50,000 people that, because it's part of life. These are the, the, all these processes are very, very, very well established and uh, since years. What we did, the last one, was exactly the same as we did always. We just didn't lose time. We didn't, we were not careful with money. Instead of uh, recruiting 50,000 people over a year, because we had, let's say, 30 hospitals doing the recruitment, we went with 150 hospitals doing the recruitment. That cost a lot of money. But instead of recruiting them in a year, we recruited them in three, four months. So I did this type of things by taking return on investment, taking cost out of the equation, and we were able to achieve this result. But it's not the process, believe me. It is the heart of the people. People don't know what they can and what they cannot do. And if anything, they have a serious tendency to underestimate what they can do. And always, when you ask them something that is seemingly impossible, they will think out of the box to be able to deliver. We discussed about the timing. Instead of eight years, we didn't ask them to do it in six. We asked them to do it in eight months. Huh. <laughs> Our normal manufacturing yearly production of Pfizer was 200 million doses of vaccines every year. That was what we are doing in the last 10 years. We didn't ask them to make 300 million doses for a new vaccine. We asked them to make 3 billion doses for a new vaccine. The discovery phase of a new molecule, like the treatment that we have now, the pill against COVID, takes four years. We didn't ask them to do it in three. We asked them to do it in four months, which is what they did. When you are setting this type of goals, they know immediately. They, they cannot just think within the box. And immediately, this is where the human ingenuity and the heart comes. And this is how they surprised all of us. No, they should not uh, fear something like that. It's completely wrong. There is no medical product in the history of humanity that have been tested as much as this vaccine has been administered to hundreds of millions of people. And because of the importance of COVID, they have been scrutinized, those people, constantly. Right now, healthcare authorities are looking for every single signal around the world of people that they got the vaccine and try to see if it is vaccine related or not. There are electronic medical records that will tell us when and what happened to a person when he did got the vaccine. And we know now more, we have so high certainty that it is so safe exactly as the data sit says about this vaccine more than any other product. They should not be afraid of something like that. And they should not listen to information that it is misinformation that it is spread on purpose. <laughs> I wouldn't disagree with that at all. I don't think that... <laughs> as somebody uh, who's not wearing a tie. <laughs> and as, as you ca people can see that I'm not wearing a tie and you are. <laughs> but um, it's not about um, uh, being able, those that they have the power, to, to impose on the others the stigma that uh, you what you are saying is misinformation. But there are a few things that as society we have accomplished, and science is one of them. And uh, data is, and analytics of data is another one. 
And uh, to say that uh, something uh, which is highly scientific by people that they are not scientists, uh, I, I, I think that it is not what you are describing, what used to happen in the Soviet Union or in any other autocratic uh, regime in the world right now. Humility is a virtue. Yes. And uh, yes. the fact that you are educated doesn't mean that you are having either humility or empathy or you have good uh, human qualities. This was never and will never be a, a, a metric of judging this type of virtues. Um, those that they do this, they're wrong. And actually, they they are not doing good service to the public health because they're undermining. People are not stupid. They see if you're not uh, be respecting them and if you're not respecting their need to learn because that affects their health, the health of the mother, of the kids. So I fully agree with you that we should be very patient to explain again and again and again what is happening. And the vast majority of the people that they don't get vaccinations right now is because they're afraid. It's not for any other reason. It's not that they have a, an agenda. What I'm saying it is there is a small number of people yeah. that they have made business for them to profit from this anxiety. I'll give you an example. I have been arrested by FBI. This is what someone wrote. I, I read it, I laughed. I mean, okay, th this is where they take it. There was a reason why they wrote it that. The Pfizer CEO was arrested FBI because they want to create doubts in the minds of the people that they're afraid and say, look, if FBI arrested him, likely I will not do the vaccine. But I laughed. A week later, the wife of the Pfizer CEO died. Hmm. There is a picture in, the, in this website of my wife. Someone sends to me, now I'm pissed, I'm not laughing. I try to find my kids to tell them, if you read something, mom is fine, don't worry. Then I remember that she has very old parents back in Greece. We start calling them to making sure because we know that that will be picked up by Greek newspapers and they will, uh, will publish it, okay? They are the, those people that wrote these things. They know very well that my wife didn't die and died because she, she was vaccinated. Right, So this is the narratives that they are on purpose forming to profit from uh, the stress and uh, uh, the anxiety of good people. No, I never said something 100% that every time I speak, if a number is 100%, I rush to say that in biology there is nothing 100%, right. because always there will be when you go to the millions, okay? There were, in the study, things that were 100%, for example, deaths. Or in South Africa, yeah. when we tried, there was 100% efficacy. Clearly, in small numbers. When the numbers will become much bigger, the 100% will not hold, but will be 95, 96. So still, the direction of this is the point. So I'm very, very careful how I, what I tweet. And uh, in addition to how careful I am, I have people that uh, they are looking at it and they are having second or third opinions to make sure that we don't put. Why? Because I know that people are listening to me right now, everything I say. Yeah. And I want to make sure that they continue not only, not only being clear as to what I want to say, so there are no misunderstandings, but also I maintain the trust of the people. I don't think that uh, someone who only cherry picks information and only emphasizes positive things it's someone that it is the one to be trusted. And I want me and Pfizer to be trusted. Yes. In the beginning, when we had the first uh, months of the vaccine, people would ask me, do we need another one? And I said, we don't know. Yeah. I was very clear about it. Then around April, May, I start seeing the first data and I made statements that I think we will need a booster around eight to 12 months after the second dose. And then after that, annual revaccinations. This is what I said, believe is the, one of the most likely scenarios. And it was based on the data that I had, but then Delta came. And because I always making the, the, the caveat that with absent a new variant, with everything we know. 
With Delta, it pro was proven that we need the booster to move to the three, to the six months. And this is what uh, happened. And uh, I still said, I think the booster is a six months, and then I think it will be an annual revaccination, likely. We have to monitor to see the data, but this is the likely scenario. Now, we have Omicron. And uh, Omicron says that uh, two doses might be challenging. We don't know exactly yet, but three doses work. So clearly, a lot of countries already started moving now, the third dose, not in six, from six months to three, so that uh, they will reduce the period that people will not be protected with, uh, with uh, the third dose. Uh, I don't know with Omicron if how long this will last. And frankly, I don't know if we will need a new vaccine tailor-made to Omicron based on everything we know so far. We are monitoring and we will know way more in the weeks to come. If there is a need for a new vaccine, we will have it. And if there is a need for mass production of this new vaccine, I can also feel very comfortable that we will not lose any of our capacity that we have developed. Right now we are running at 1 billion, almost approximately, doses per quarter, four per year. And if we have to switch and have half of that in the new, half of that in the old, we will do still 4 billion doses. So I think wow. the world should feel very, very comfortable that if there is a need, we will be ahead of the virus. I think it is uh, a very difficult uh, topic in, and a very difficult decision who, whoever needs to make it. And clearly it's not me. It is the public health officials of every country that they have to make this decision. I have to make the decision for Pfizer employees. And I had to, to balance uh, the fear of those that they work, that they want to feel that the others are vaccinated, and the fear of those that they don't want to get the vaccine. And eventually, I came to the decision that we will mandate it at Pfizer. We are flexible. We are giving exceptions, of course, for health, maybe some religions. Uh, but uh, we decided to, to mandate it. Now, at Pfizer, we, when we did this decision, we were at 90% vaccination rates when we said we are going to mandate it. Uh, and that took it up to 96. It works. Right, uh, this ten percent was never going to move. I felt because no matter what, you have a small number of people that really are scared, and they don't feel comfortable to do it. Okay, it worked in our case. We, we took it to ninety-six percent. I'm happy for those people. A lot will not disease, and some will not die of of, the, of those people. But it's not to me to say because the debate uh, it's serious debate. And there are a lot of pros and cons if you need to push people, if you need to give them the freedom. Uh, and uh, it comes with the territory. If you are elected to run a country, <laughs> you should be ready to make difficult decisions. You know, because people know who I am, I had the opportunity to, em em uh, to, to interact with parents before that was, uh, let's say, approved. And there were so many, way more, that uh, I had a lot of empathy because they were afraid for their kids because they didn't have a vaccine. And they were the ones that were speaking at that time. Bring me vaccine. When are you going to bring me vaccine? I really fear. I feel that this is unfair, but I'm protected. My husband is protected. My old son is protected. And my little sweetheart, because she's below the age, is not protected. Now that we have the vaccines, I'm sure that uh, those that they are afraid of the vaccine, not of the disease, which are a smaller number, admittedly. Also, they will have, uh, if they are afraid of them, I'm sure that they will be afraid even more about their kids because they love, I would say, more than they love themselves. So it's going to be this situation. And uh, again, the same. How can we do to demonstrate, to convince people, to win the minds and the hearts of the people that this is the right thing to do? The rate is lower, but kids they do die. And how can you say that I'm not going to I'm not going to protect a kid for something that it is likely to happen? And it is not only that. What happens in the school when they stop the education process because a kid 
got the disease and they don't have vaccines so that they can control. It is such a big disruption and such a big risk for for the health of of the of the kids that it shouldn't be a debate. Look, how many kids are having polio right now? Way fewer number than those that they're having COVID in, in the hospital. But everybody's getting the vaccine. It's... Um I think choosing to vaccinate children makes a choice so that something could not potentially hurt them, which is the disease. That's why we are doing vaccinations since ever. I know that uh, there are people that they are concerned for themselves and for, for their kids. What I know it is that I'm a scientist and I'm a parent. And I am telling you that vaccines is a very good thing for kids. And thank God we were able to develop them. First of all, uh, what this is about. This is a real game changer. This is a course of treatment that you get only if you get the disease, you get COVID. Then what happens is that you will take for five days pills, day and night, and twice a day for five days. And instead of 10 people from those that disease to go to hospital, only one will go. This is an end with all the caveats that the numbers are small. No one died. It was 100% efficacy on deaths. Of course, I'm sure that uh, in uh, real world, when the numbers are getting very high, we may have uh, 99 instead of 100. But uh, these are spectacular results for something that you can take home and stay home. The biggest problem right now in Europe, in the US, when you have surges, every time that you have a surge of, uh, of COVID, it is that the ICUs are full, the hospitals are paralyzed, they have to postpone elective surgeries, they have to postpone other operations because they don't have the capacity because of that. Keeping people out of the hospitals, home, keeping people uh, without dying, uh, it is something that we didn't have before. Uh, and this is a significant, significant game changer. Not the first time. If you remember, there were other compounds that were claimed that they are uh, the, uh, the, so the solution to COVID. And uh, clearly, uh, they were proven that they are not. Uh, there are compounds that there are solutions and compounds that there are not. I, as a scientist, and I discuss with our scientists, they don't see any reason why a medicine like ivermectin, which is a parasiticide, to be able to act on COVID. And so they don't seem that there's any connection. And they haven't seen any paper that describes someone that used it that it had any results. I'm sure that there will be some people that will claim because people are claiming anything. But uh, I don't think that I, there was any paper in any peer review magazine, I mean, a reliable scientific magazine, to, to support this claim. So we are focusing on saving people's lives. We are not focusing on, uh, on uh, <laughs> craziness. I haven't seen any that it is reliable. Right. I don't know where are these, small or big, reliable. I haven't seen any. It was chloroquinolone before. Yes. Uh, for God's sake. And that's why I packed How many people died because of that? Yeah, this is the, the, this is, this is the dangerous thing. This is the sad thing. Yeah. Paxlovid so. has been studying thousands of people and will be under the scrutiny not only of uh, regulators, but uh, as we will go into the implementation, as it happened in many countries, they will monitor to see what's happened. Mm -hmm. With let, Let's say that whatever we do, once it is out there, within a few weeks, they will know all hospitals if it works or not, because they will see the statistics. I think the human ingenuity. I think although there, there is, um, the world always is progressing. Although there are a lot of things that uh, need to be fixed in the society of 2020, 
the site of 2020 is better at large than things 50 years back, 100 years back, in all different aspects, from poverty, for human rights, from, uh, from uh, science, from quality of life, from any aspect. I am positive that uh, humans uh, can create and always create a better future and will continue doing so. That's a very interesting question. I, I was discussing with a lot of people that I was fearless of death. I couldn't care less when I was young. The first thing, the first time that uh, I start feeling that I want to be around was when I had kids. And then I started feeling that, oh gosh, is it, I hope I will be around to see their wedding. I hope they will be around to see their, their children. So if there is something that scares me is the possibility I will not be part of their lives anymore and I will not be watching. I hope there is life upstairs yeah. So I will be able to watch them <laughs> from there. <laughs> I would repeat something that uh, uh, Steve Jobs has said. Uh, death is life's biggest invention. Uh, it eliminates the old and uh, gives place to the new. Uh, life is all about moving forward. Life is all about uh, creating new things. Uh, maybe everyone is a contributor, but no one is the owner. Thank you for your interest, and I'm happy, as I was telling you before, that uh, I can uh, brag with my kids that, that I was in your podcast because you are their heroes. This is the Lex Free Podcast.